at 707. Now here's Katie. Okay, Al, thank you. On Close Up this morning, the disappearance of an entire American city. As we've been telling you this morning, Grand Forks, North Dakota, has been ravaged by floods and fires, and the waters are not expected to begin receding for another five days. NBC's Carrie Sanders has the view from above the city this morning. Carrie, good morning to you. You're breaking up a bit, but what can you tell us about uh, the view from below, or from above, rather? Okay, good morning, Katie. As we take you outside, you can see this is the view as the sun comes up this morning. It uh, is completely uh, flooded out. I want to take you into some tight shots of this area because it almost looks like a giant lake here. But as we come in and we zoom in, you can see areas where people once called home. And as we come in nice and tight here and move along very slowly, you can see rooftops. That tells you that the water in some of these areas here is about seven feet. And as we move along there, you can see a bridge. That is one of the bridges that takes people normally across the Red River. The Red River that is obviously well beyond its uh, banks here. And that bridge, along with the other bridges, are all closed. So there's really no way, even for the folks with the National Guard, to go back and forth from Grand Forks to East Grand Forks. And as we come in down here and we move in, this is just neighborhood after neighborhood after neighborhood that is flooded out. As you know, this is an area in this community of about 50,000. 90% of the people have evacuated, and they will be out of this area, it's estimated, for at least three weeks because of the flooding. So as these waters may begin to recede in a couple of weeks, the uh, people will not be allowed back because of the water problems. The water is contaminated, the sewage is backed up, mm. and these neighborhoods are uh, basically unsafe even when that water recedes. And one of the biggest problems that will happen when the water eventually recedes is homeowners will find not only that their homes are destroyed, but they're filled with uh, mud that has been traveling with this water. Terry, I know in some cases the flood waters are as high as 15 feet. That's correct. In the area just a little bit to uh, our, our west, the water is quite that high. But as you see as it comes through here, I mean, even in areas that were considered high ground, I mean, we're talking about an area that the uh, federal planners say is in the 500-year floodplain. Mm -hmm. Even in areas that are in the 500-year floodplain are underwater this morning. It looks like a ghost town from your perspective, and most people have, in fact, followed the mandatory evacuation orders. Have you seen yeah. any sign of life down there? The, the only signs of life that we've seen this morning are the few National Guard trucks, those really big troop transport trucks that have been moving through, patrolling the area, making sure that everybody has indeed followed the rules and evacuated as they were told to do. I mean, the real concern is that, as you know, there have been some fires here. In fact, there were three fires overnight, three more homes destroyed. And while the electrical system has been shut down in a lot of areas, there is still concern for that being a real problem. And really, if the people can be evacuated, as they have done successfully so far, the, 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 while there's a tremendous loss here of uh, people's homes and property and, of course, their memories, they don't want to see anybody die in a fire. What was it like for you getting around the city before you got in the chopper? I'm sorry, Katie, what was that? What was it like getting around the city before you got in the chopper this morning? Uh, the, the area around, I'm not sure I can hear your question, but the area around town on the outside, most people are, are staying, for instance, at an Air Force base not too far from here where they're sleeping in cots inside of hangars. Uh, and they're seeing these pictures uh, and, and really finding it very difficult to deal with because what they're seeing is their, their lives gone. Now, while the federal government and the president will be here later today, and the president will do much what we're showing you right now, touring this area by helicopter, the, uh, the, the hope is that while the federal government provides about 75% federal financial assistance for the people to eventually recover, there are many people here hoping that the president will announce while he's here that he may up that to 90% or maybe even 100% financial assistance to make this area whole again because right. it's going to be a, a billion dollar job. All right, Carrie Sanders, Carrie, thank you so much as always. We'll check sure. in with you later. As Carrie mentioned, the president will visit Grand Forks this afternoon. He'll be greeted by North Dakota's Governor Ed Schaefer. Governor Schaefer, good morning to you, sir. Good morning, Katie. Well, you just saw the view from above. Have you ever seen anything like this in your life? No, this is absolutely unbelievable. and. Uh, 
as you saw from the helicopter, the destruction of this city is uh, unreal, and plus the emotional turmoil that has thrown all the citizens of North Dakota into as well. What's the biggest problem uh, as you make plans for recovery? Well, I think uh, we, we have to figure out a way to get people back into this community. It's going to be a long-term recovery. And, uh, of course, the economic impact. that We've got about 10% of the people of North Dakota that are displaced uh, one way or another uh, across this uh, across this state with this problem. Uh, it's going to be a huge economic impact for this region, this area, and uh, just rebuilding people's lives and getting back in this community is of great concern of ours. How much is this going to cost, Governor? I've, I've seen different figures, anywhere from 40 million to a billion dollars. We have no idea what it's going to cost. Of course, our first concern right now is containing the flood and taking care of people and making sure they're dry and safe. and. You know, we're going to worry about how much it costs as we rebuild this city. I'm convinced that, that with the spirit of North Dakotans and with our people working together and the can-do attitude that we will rebuild Grand Forks, North Dakota to better than it was before. Will you try to get help from the federal government when the president comes today? Will you ask him for 100 percent financial help? Well, and, uh, when I requested the presidential disaster, I, I requested a 90% federal share. Uh, we received a 75% share. I've been urging the president to move that up. We're anxious to hear about his rebuilding plan. We keep hearing uh, pieces that he may be uh, delivering the message today of hope for North Dakota for rebuilding. Uh, we'll uh, obviously need a lot of financial help here, and we're going to be looking to the federal government and all of the people of the United States of America to help us out in this very tra tragic situation. Clearly, no one anticipated this flood. It's been called the 500-year flood. Having said that, do residents have flood insurance? Uh, some residents do have flood insurance. Uh, we did. We had a very tragic s uh, winter here. The snow was incredible. We actually had a presidential disaster for a winter storm here when most of our state was shut down. We had high snows. We knew the water was coming and did a lot of work with public service announcements. Uh, the federal emergency management people were in here with public service announcements as well. And we did urge everybody to get flood insurance that was anywhere near, but we didn't know that the water was going to be high, so there are a lot of people that are uncovered. Meanwhile, I know the Red River flows north, and it may be weeks, as we've said, until it recedes. How, how long do you think it will take before people can actually examine their homes and the extent of the damage? Well, we're going to do some uh, photo surveillance, some videos, and high-resolution photography uh, today and tomorrow so that people can start getting a feel. We will distribute those photos so people can start to see what damage they may or may not have as they are displaced. Uh, but uh, it's going to be a couple of weeks before people start to get back in. We're working on a plan now of security, mm -hmm. of getting people move, you know, move back into their, their communities and their homes and neighborhoods. We're seeing an aerial view, Governor, of one of the fires just uh, going out now, still smoking. Is that still an area of concern? Yes, fires are a concern. We have a lot of gas leaks, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, so we're, you know, it's a problem. And, and as we saw with our big fire downtown, you just you don't have access with the equipment to fight these fires properly. Well, best of luck to you, Governor Schaefer, and our very best wishes to all the residents of Grand Thank Forks. You. Thanks so Thank much you. for talking with us. It's coming up on 716. Now here's Matt. Katie, thank you. Now to the Timothy McVeigh trial in Denver. They'll be wrapping up jury selection there today, and Court TV's Dan Abrams is outside the courthouse in Denver this morning. Dan, good morning to you. Good morning, Matt. Dan, this is the day that the lawyers for both sides let fire or water keep it from making it to the newsstands. Looking at those homes, you can imagine, Incredible. only imagine, line. what it may, must look like inside, covered with mud, water. Since 1982, I understand your job's to get the news out, but you find yourself strangely in the middle of this story. How have you managed to stay in business? Well, the business of the newspaper is to publish, and what happened was when the, the floods came in, the fire burned our building, we relocated our news staff to another area. We have a sister newspaper in St. Paul. We were able to get our news to the newspaper uh, via the internet. We got our photographs there. The St. Paul Pioneer Press printed the newspaper for us, and then we chartered airplanes, flew the newspapers back to us, and got uh, the uh, distribution here in Grand Forks. So we did not miss a day of publishing. Let me take you back a step first of all. You've got reporters on the scene. You have photographers on the scene. Where are they actually writing and putting those stories together in the Grand Forks area? 
Uh, right now, we are in a small school in, the, in a town called Manville, North Dakota. We've uh, essentially commandeered the school. They've been really nice to let us in. Today, school is going on at the same time, so we're, we are going to be producing a newspaper and classes will be going on at the same time. So after the papers are flown back to the, to the Grand Forks area from St. Paul, how are they actually getting to the people? Are you putting them in central areas and the people coming to get them? Right, we have our circulation people are still around, uh, our bundle haulers are still around. Uh, we pick up the newspapers, we take them out to the shelters, we take them out to the stores, any place that's open. The newspaper is free. We've printed many more of them than we ever have before just to get the news out. No ads in the paper, I understand. You're concerned with the, the information that people need. What are the most important types of stories that you're printing in the paper these days? What we're doing is we're just trying to give a picture of what happened. We're trying to give an aerial overview uh, of, what is, of what has happened. So people know what, where, where people have gone, what has happened to the city, what businesses have, uh, have uh, been affected. Just the, a, a complete, as a complete as possible news story as we can of what, the, uh, of what this uh, uh, flood and fire has done to our city. Mike, you're a guy who deals in headlines. Then, then capture the story, if you can, for me in the major headline. Well, the one I have right now is, is the one I think that told it all. It says, come hell or high water, come hell and high water. And that's what really uh, happened to us uh, in, in uh, at the Grand Forks Herald. We had both a flood and we had a fire. And despite the fact that those two things hit us one, two, we, uh, we, we published. And that is something that I think all of us at the, at the newspaper, all the reporters, people throughout that, uh, our company feel uh, they, we're still standing and we're still, we're still fighting back. Well, you and your staff are to be congratulated for that. And we certainly wish you the best of luck. Thank you so much, Matt. Mike Maidenberg, thanks very much. Mike Maidenberg is the publisher of the paper. However, he has not been allowed to go back downtown to see the remains of his building. Kerry Sanders, however, is in a helicopter hovering above Grand Forks. Kerry, good morning again to you. What's it look like at the newspaper building? Well, good morning. Let me take you down to a live picture outside the helicopter of the building, and there you can see this series of buildings that caught fire. They still don't know how this fire began, but you can see the smoldering remains of what was once a very important part of this community, not only because of the history of the buildings and what the paper does on a daily basis, but what was inside the paper, the archives that date back to the beginning of this town. It, basically, the history of this community has gone up in flames in this horrible flood. Now, as we take you from this downtown area and we come a little bit to the left, we will take you down the streets, which here the water is, in some cases, as deep as 16 feet. And we'll bring you along, and what we'll do is we'll take you from the downtown area, which you can see is underwater, and there you can see some of the road leading up to the bridge. One of There's two bridges. Let's just stop for a moment. That's both bridges that cross the Red River, and as you can see how high the river has swollen, that really you can hardly even see much of the tarmac on the bridges. All you can really see is the, uh, the, the, the top of the bridges right there. Now, as we come a little bit further to the left, we're gonna take you into some of the residential areas. And Matt, what we've got is very few people downtown, but there are some people in this area this morning that have found an area where they've been able to launch some boats. And those boats are going out each day where they are looking for animals that may be trapped, people who they believe all have been evacuated, but there's always concern right. that there may be some more people who are inside their homes, and they've got these boats to go out and search for them. Kerry, on, you can on, see, Matt. on a more personal level, you've covered a lot of floods for us in the past. How does this compare with what you've seen in other parts of the country? This is truly horrible. This is really one of the worst floods I have ever seen, perhaps the worst I've ever seen in my life. Even in terms of natural disasters, this is one of the worst I've ever seen because we're talking about an entire community and they've lost the sewers, they've lost the uh, clean water supplies, electricity is out in a lot of areas. This is going to be a lasting problem. This is not as soon as the water goes away, everybody moves back into their homes and tries to clean up. This is going to be a very difficult rebuilding right. effort for the community. Kerry Sanders flying above Grand Forks, North Dakota. Kerry, thanks very much. Sure. It is 7.49. This is Today on NBC. Terrible damage from a season of record snows, record floods, and a devastating fire. Any promised help is on the way. Some of it immediately.
The president toured the cities of Grand Forks, North Dakota and East Grand Forks, Minnesota. Two communities once divided by the Red River, now swamped by its record floods. NBC's David Bloom with the president tonight. Aboard Marine One surveying the devastation done by floods and fire, President Clinton came to Grand Forks, North Dakota today, promising federal help and trying mightily to boost this region's morale. And it seemed to work. You coming today, Mr. President, you bring us hope. Hope and money. Mr. Clinton announcing that he's asked Congress to appropriate $200 million more in emergency aid close to half a billion in total for disaster relief in North and South Dakota and Minnesota. The spirit and faith that are in those people. Water cannot wash that away, and we'll be there with you every step of the way. But as he listened to the heart-wrenching stories, the president acknowledged that the hurts won't soon go away. Kurt Truen lost his home and business, and then saw his friends lose theirs. You take and hold them in your arms, and you tell them, It'll be all right, but you probably know it won't be. I know that uh, $488 million or $4 billion wouldn't make that go away, but at least we want you to know that we are going to be there over the long run. This afternoon, Mr. Clinton met briefly with some of the almost 60,000 people forced to evacuate Grand Forks and East Grand Forks in neighboring Minnesota. More than 2,000 people are now huddled in hangars at Grand Forks Air Force Base. And with the Red River at more than twice its flood stage and not expected to recede for another week, it could be another month before most people can go home. It's definitely gloomy. I mean, it's a situation where, you know, you, you, you can't sleep. I mean, you'll probably get uh, two hours of sleep a night, I think I'm averaging. And yet over and over again, Grand Forks' resolute mayor vowed today, we will rebuild. And we will rebuild. We have the spirit and love in the community like you have never seen in your life. The most unnerving thing facing these evacuees is the uncertainty. They don't know when they're going home and they don't know what they'll face when they get there. And there's little that anyone from the president on down can do about that. Tom? Thanks very much, David Bloom tonight in Grand Forks. Think about this for a moment. About 10% of the population of North Dakota displaced by these floods. Let's go now to NBC's Kerry Sanders in a helicopter over Grand Forks to show us the big view and how it's spreading north from there. Harry, what's the biggest problem besides the obvious high water? Well, the problem is, is that the waters are not receding. Let me take you down here and take you to a live picture. It is a watery ghost town here, and as we pull out and take you through the neighborhoods here, you can see that in some cases the water is feet deep. Other cases it's a little bit less, but the water is not going down. And to rise. Tom? Kerry, if we can uh, hold on to that picture for just a moment, what's the best guess now on when some of the residents will be able to return to any of the homes that have been cut off by the floodwaters? Now, the folks who live in this area, and I'm not talking about just this picture, I'm talking about in this community, have not been able to return to their homes. They left, in some cases, with 15 minutes notice, and they will not be able to return, in some cases, for more than three weeks. There's a problem that's complicating the flood, and that is that the sewage pipes have broken here in town, contaminated the water, and there's a real concern for a health problem. And as that river continues to flood, spreading north now from Grand Forks, what about those homes and businesses that we're looking at how many are simply beyond repair, Terry? Well, in many cases, the foundations here, which uh, some of these homes date back to the late 1800s, have been shaken. So uh, it's going to be a very difficult process if they're going to be able to return to their homes if the building specters will allow them. All right. Thanks very much. Kerry Sanders tonight in a helicopter over Grand Forks, North Dakota. Among the many stories of resilience that have emerged from the flood country, one that's made a very big impression is the Grand Forks Herald little newspaper that can, even in the midst of a tragedy. Publisher Mike Maidenberg told us what it's been like tonight in his own words. We felt and have always felt that what a newspaper does is published and you could have a flood, you could have fire, but we are not going to be defeated by either of those things. We're going to publish a damn newspaper. A newspaper to us is a living thing. It belongs to us, the reporters and editors and managers, but it really belongs to the people who read it. We bring these newspapers out to the evacuation centers, to the stores. Uh, people are clamoring for it. They want it. 
if we couldn't deliver that to, to people, then the flood really would have defeated us. And that we were not going to let happen. So it's been a very, very trying uh, situation. Most of us wound up in a newsroom with only the clothes on our back and maybe a little, you know, maybe another, another change. But we had to regroup and get a, a newspaper out. We had the people. That was the, that was the critical thing. We had some computers. We send our stories, we send our photographs to the St. Paul Pioneer Press. Uh, they put the newspaper together there. They actually create a Grand Forks Herald where there was none before. We all feel that this is a great, a great purpose for us, a great, a great uh, thing to be accomplished, to publish a newspaper in, this, in, in a city which has been destroyed. Grand Forks Herald publisher Mike Maidenberg tonight, in his own words. Coming up on NBC News In Depth, moving a whole city to temporary shelters, how to keep families and services going in Grand Forks. Also tonight, your tax dollars being used to promote all kinds of products. Yeah, what was Grand Forks, North Dakota on high ground? Was. Ice cold floodwaters now lapping at the rooftops of some buildings. Nothing but an eerie silence in the air. Everyone has been evacuated virtually. But for all of the property loss, there is, of course, also tremendous, tremendous psychic damage. For those who have lost so much, those who are trying to keep this community going in the middle of a major disaster. Our in depth report tonight from NBC's Jim Abela. To the nation, this is Grand Forks. High water and a skyline left in silhouette by a raging fire. But soon, these burned out monuments to the flood of 97 will be gone. And the people of Grand Forks say they will remember their fight to save and rebuild North Dakota's third largest city. We're running 24 hours. Uh, drivers are switching every 12 hours, trying to slow the water down with this dike. Downtown, just a block from the fire damage, is a testament to the will to survive in Grand Forks. If things get wet, the whole cable will short out and uh, everything will go dead. So no dial tone? No dial tone. Knee deep in water, the U.S. West Telephone Switching Station is the only building still open in downtown Grand Forks. 50,000 phone lines serving all of Northeast North Dakota are in the basement here, and the floodwaters are deep. This is their only link to the outside world right now. Not as deep as the commitment of the 17 men working around the clock shifts, sleeping in their offices to keep communication between the stranded and the rescue teams open. After three full days and nights of pumping, the battle is not yet won. You can see that the Red River is still rushing inside the building. The water is still two to three feet deep, but the lines are dry and the phones are still working. The idea that people can still call and talk to people makes us feel very good. The water plant is uh, submerged right now. And they are talking. One radio station is still broadcasting in Grand Forks, a 24-hour emergency uplink that has helped hold this town together. Maybe some temporary housing. It will be at least two weeks before Grand Forks dries out enough for flood refugees, more than 45,000 of them, to return home. We got out alive. We're lucky. I mean, everybody is. Wanda Puppy is in her 60s and out of her lifelong home. She won't complain about any of her lost valuables, but she will miss family albums and the memories that went down the river with them. They're gone then. You, you know, the people I have left, I've got them, so that's uh, better than nothing. It has been a crushing season of despair on the Northern Plains, but every time a North Dakotan sees this skyline, this promise is made. North Dakota's spirits, uh, spirit and resiliency, and I think we're going to rebuild Grand Forks better than it was before. NBC Jim Avila tonight in North Dakota. We'll be back in a moment. And toured the disaster area by helicopter. He saw the brown sewage stenched floodwaters that have taken over the town and forced 50,000 people to flee. The president is ordering the government to pay 100 percent. Anyone who has been here and seen the destruction, uh, as I have, knows that this is not an ordinary disaster if there is such a thing. The people here are giving 100 percent, and we should too. That 100 percent instead of 75 percent. The flooding is blamed on heavy winter snow and a quick... ...and forks, and we're going to talk to James Lee Witt. He is the FEMA director to find out when people there will start seeing the federal money that they need so badly to rebuild their lives. On a much lighter note, you remember the Donna Summer song? But the river is still near its flood crest, 
Tuesday, President Clinton got a close look at Grand Forks, which may stay flooded for weeks. NBC's Joe Johns traveled with the president. In a helicopter over Grand Forks, the president got to see the devastation, which some predict could exceed a billion dollars. He promised almost half a billion in federal money and gave encouragement to those who may have lost everything in this record-breaking flood. I don't recall ever in my life seeing anything like this, and I have been very impressed by the, the courage and the faith that all of you have shown in the face of what has been a terrible, terrible dilemma. Some of the evacuees in the audience had slept for days on cots in this temporary shelter. They stand in lines to make phone calls and look for notes from loved ones posted on a bulletin board. Many cannot predict when they will go home or what they will find when they get there. I've got a real good idea what I'm going to be going back to. It's my, I was in a basement apartment. Right now, they're feeling so overwhelmed that the reality of what has happened hasn't even hit them as yet. But what has overwhelmed officials in this region is the staggering estimated cost of rebuilding. And Congress still has to approve the money the president promised. Joe Johns, NBC News, with the president in Grand Forks. The Air Force has released new pictures of the site. Grand Forks, Brad Woodard is at ground level in a boat. Good morning to both of you. Good morning. Good morning. Carrie, let's start with you. What are you seeing this morning? Well, the president is gone, but what remains is the water. As we take you down outside, you can see the extent of the floodwaters. The uh, river has crested at 54 feet, and they believe that's about where it's going to be, 26 feet above flood stage. Uh, the bad news is, is it really hasn't changed much from yesterday. Uh, and as we take you through here, you can see, uh, you can hardly even see a road. If you look a little bit along there, you can see sort of a line that may look like a road. That's actually some of the sandbags. And as we take you down into the neighborhoods, you can see how deep this water really is. In some cases, maybe uh, three weeks before people get a chance to return to their homes. One of the problems is uh, there really is still concern about fires. There was a fire overnight. Uh, the fire department was able to get to the fire and douse the flames, but not until it actually gutted the interior of the home. Carrie? They're unsure, yeah. Can you give me an idea of the size of the area we're talking about? If you were to take Grand Forks and put it at the center of a circle, how large an area extends from that center? Well, I mean, you're talking miles here. What, what I think we can do here is let's just take this home right here with the roof, and what we'll do is we'll pull out, okay? And we will bring the camera completely out here and sort of reveal to you the extent of what is really a huge lake at this point. I mean, it just continues and continues. We'll bring it all the way out, and then as we bring it out, we're just going to swing the camera around. And as we turn the camera around and pan around, you will see that this just continues from neighborhood to neighborhood throughout downtown, beyond downtown. And one of the things to point out, unlike many areas in this country, this is isolated in the sense that there are not a lot of suburbs surrounding this area. So the people who have been flooded out of their homes don't have another place to go to, really, because there aren't homes out there to go to. I mean, they go to Fargo, which is about two hours away. Let's keep it coming around there. You'll see. Well, Kerry, let me do this. Let me leave you for one second and go down to Brad Woodard, who is in a boat in Grand Forks, North Dakota, this morning. Brad, how do things look at water level? Well, Matt, it's, it's like being in a third world country here in Grand Forks today. There is very little electricity. There is no running water for drinking, bathing, or toilet use. And yet, all through Grand Forks, it seems there's nothing but water. Contaminated water filled with sewage 3 to 17 feet deep. It is now believed that the Red River has crested at about 54 feet, 26 feet above flood level. That's the good news, believe it or not. The bad news, the river is expected to remain at or near crest level for a week or so, which means it could be a number of weeks before the 50,000 residents who've been evacuated from their homes are able to return to their homes. Brad, we talked about President Clinton visiting that area on Tuesday along with James Lee Witt of FEMA. Has their visit helped the spirits of people there at all? Uh, to be quite honest with you, the people who, who saw the president speak yesterday were very uplifted, but quite frankly, so many people here are just so focused on getting through the day, they didn't really have time to stop and, and take note of what's going on here. Uh, th this has been described as a slow motion disaster. When you're dealing with hurricanes and tornadoes, you're talking about events that transpire in a matter of hours and minutes. This really began last November with the first blizzard, followed by record snowfall, 115 inches of snowfall 
and this is the end result. Brad, what about the buildings? When you get close to these buildings and you take a good look at them, does it appear that they can be salvaged or will the water damage be so severe that they'll have to be torn down and people will have to just start over? It's really difficult to assess that right now. Damage is estimated in the hundreds of millions of dollars, but until the water recedes, and that will be some time, there's no way to get a, a firm handle on how severe the damage is. Now, some of the buildings that have caught fire downtown, historical buildings, are going to have to be torn down because they're completely gutted, bombed out. In fact, they brought in the wrecking ball yesterday. You have to keep in mind here, we're not just talking about homes that are underwater, but businesses in a town of 50,000 people. Businesses that are not generating revenue, which means the, the residents here are not generating income. And getting those businesses back on their feet is among the top priorities here right now. Brad, let me go back up to Kerry Sanders in the chopper. Kerry, you're obviously landing in that chopper at an Air Force base or an airport nearby. That would be the way that a lot of the supplies coming into that area would arrive. Are you seeing those supplies? Uh, we are seeing some of those supplies. Most of them are coming into the Air Force Base. Believe it or not, the commercial airport is still operating here. As we take you back outside, you know, as we look at this area, you know, we heard them talk about the businesses. You know, the problem is, is that when these businesses do get the opportunity to reopen, their employees won't be able to come back to work because they're going to have to be working on their homes. This river, it's important to note, flows north, unlike most rivers. And so the people in the path up towards Canada are still bracing. Many of them have evacuated. They've got about 3,500 homes in the path of uh, continued floodwaters expected to arrive there in the next uh, coming days. All right, Kerry Sanders above Grand Forks, North Dakota. Brad Woodard on the water in Grand Forks, North Dakota. Has been a campus and it's now canceled the classes so that they can allow evacuees into this shelter. They've made room for people to watch TV, to have a pool table over here. They've also got a number of games from coloring books for the children. They've even got some popcorn uh, popping right now. You know, this is far from home sweet home, but the people here sure, sure do have a very big heart. Mayville, North Dakota will make you proud. When the people up north in Grand Forks were flooded out with nowhere to go, the people of Mayville reached out to help. Why don't I just take this? Is there more for me? College student Stephanie Munson gathered food and clothes from her neighbors and donated them to the shelter. I saw an older gentleman who didn't look like he had a lot. He was just sitting out on the street in one of the pictures and, you know, where is he going to go? Who's going to be able to help him? I think that's really tough to see a lot of the elderly that are alone. Thank you very much. We'll take care of it. Science teacher Carla Alt volunteers at the donation center. She says for many evacuees, the reality sinks in when they enter this room. They're not used to being on the receiving end of charity. Many people have told me we feel like refugees. We feel like the end of the world has come. Even the children are proud. She was, hadn't had a shower. She was not groomed. She came in and she looked at the toys over here and said, um, can I have this little bag? And it was just this little bag. And she filled it with these little items that were totally priceless to her and walked out with tears in her eyes. Hi. Hi. Did you guys get settled last night then? Yeah. yeah. Good. Yeah. Deb Sletton opened her heart and her home. Well, her aunt's home, that is. We haven't told our aunt yet, but she'll find out. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and we thought, well, she doesn't live here anymore. And we thought we had some stuff left in it from what, before we moved her to her apartment. We thought, what a good thing to do. Now you can have something to do today. Are you too old to color? Yeah. Nobody's too old to color. Do I get a hug? Thank you. <laughs> but for those who have nothing to smile about, Mary Stamen is doing her best to touch them the way they touch her. When you see the people here, how does it touch you? Right down to the bottom of your soul, the bottom of your heart. What lifts you up the most? When the little kids give you a hug and say thank you. We're back live now and you're seeing a little boy here trying to get some sleep. There's just so many wonderful things going on here at this shelter. Just down the hall, they've got a table. A table for people who need emergency cash. $25, no questions asked. Brian? It's pretty extraordinary, and anyone who's spent any time in the Midwest realizes we're talking about some pretty extraordinary people uh, on a good day. Um, 
There's a, a program, I know all the TV stations are on the air around the clock out there uh, telling people uh, about homes where they have a spare bedroom, a spare couch, and where to go. How is that working? Well, here they've got a, a, a kind of a bank, a phone bank, people calling in saying, I've got some extra room, I've got an extra uh, mother-in-law unit, and, and people are responding, people are giving their extra units so that if there is someone who needs something immediately, then they just try to match them up. And in fact, 65% of the people who have come through here have actually been taken in by families. Farlan Chang, thank you for what's been an interesting view of uh, just how much help is available to the, the folks out there. Much more on the floods and another friendly face from Washington showing up to show support when this broadcast returns. ...of the National Red Cross, Elizabeth Dole came to town. She started her tour by car, driving past some of the shops and homes abandoned by owners who are now receiving help from relief agencies, including the Red Cross. And you see the dust and the mud that is left after the waters recede even a bit. Then she switched over to a boat for a closer look at the downtown area, a lot like the one we just got, uh, all but submerged uh, underwater, everything from the uh, city hall there to the uh, Central High School. Later, Mrs. Dole told reporters what she'd seen. You look at the area downtown there where the fires occurred, and it looks like a war zone. I mean, it's just uh, incredible. Fires on top of the flooding, and uh, in every direction, as far as you can see, water. It's, uh, it's really quite expansive, and obviously a lot of work ahead. But I was just saying that Red Cross is going to be right here to help. First to arrive, last to leave. And, uh, and I'm so impressed with the spirit of people wanting to help each other, no matter how much they've suffered. She's received pretty good marks uh, for her stewardship of the Red Cross. We should point out their national 800 number is raising money locally for uh, the victims in uh, North Dakota. She promised to send in trained counselors today to help people get over the trauma of the floods. Normally, a gentleman named Byron Sievers is with the Grand Forks Police Department. He is also holding down another job these days, acting as public information officer for the Emergency Operations Center. He joins us tonight from Grand Forks, and uh, thank you very much for joining us. You're welcome, Brian. Uh, what, uh, what, is the, uh, what is top of mind with you, probably the number one problem right now when people ask? Well, health and safety concern right now. This is still an evacuated city. We have uh, mandatory evacuation here. A lot of them want to return to get uh, items, checkbooks, whatever. And it's still a very dangerous situation. The current is still running very rapidly downtown. We're still at uh, over 53 feet uh, flood level. Now, if I am the owner of a, of a business behind you downtown, let's say it's, a, it's an older brick building and I go back, what can structurally happen to a building? Uh, uh, can they be weakened by this much water for this long a time? Well, it's not only the water, but it's the current. Uh, the U.S. West building downtown fought very feverishly to uh, keep their doors closed. They had them sandbagged and just to hold the water out and the pressure on the doors from that current, they had to sandbag inside the building as well. And for people who don't understand how a water system works, how uh, there's an assumption that this, I, I asked the Coast Guard lieutenant earlier that this is somehow a closed system, a city water system. How is it that it just gets inundated and can't function anymore? Well, our water plant's uh, somewhat close to the river, and it's, out of the, it's in the 100-year floodplain, but it's still quite high. When the river raised this level, it inundated our plant. We have three intakes. Normally, we'd lose one intake on high river level. This time, we lost all three. We have no ability to, pr to produce fresh water. That's why we're keeping people out. In the more urban areas of this country, when something like this happens, we have to ask questions like, uh, has there been any looting, any people taking advantage of this situation? Anything like that in Grand Forks? You know, it's been tremendous here. Granted, we don't get a lot of reports because it's evacuated, but the police officers have been th here throughout the city day and night. Uh, noticeably, there's been little uh, looting of any kind that they've reported. Uh, uh, people have been very law-abiding. Of course, they are normally here, and uh, it's terrific that uh, everybody's fought the effort to fight this flood, and, and now they've evacuated. We haven't had problems uh, in, on a criminal t side of things. And as an example of how many people this has touched in your town, I'm curious, what about you, your friends and family and neighbors? How have you been affected by all this? Well, quite, quite severely. I mean, I lost my own home. I mean, most of us that have uh, worked in the emergency operation center, we've all lost our own homes. There's been a lot, of, a lot of hugs, a lot of tears shed. We've been fighting this for over 30 days, putting in 20, 24-hour days sometimes when it was 
a critical moment that's been devastating for all of us, including the people that have had to leave their homes. So for you, for you, you're in the public service business, you kind of have to put that out of your mind while you're doing your job during the day. You kind of have to say to yourself, I'll deal with the loss of my own home later. I've got this 80-year-old uh, woman to help more immediately, right? Exactly. We, we go into your professional mode and you know you have a job to do and you try to get it done. You hope there's light at the end of the tunnel where you can start thinking about some of your own basic needs at some time. We, we don't even feel like residents at time right now. We're not in our own homes. Uh, we're kind of occupants of the city and protectors of the city. Well, all the best to you uh, during the recovery period. Byron Sievers, is a lieutenant with the Grand Forks, North Dakota Police Department. Thanks for being with us tonight. Thank you. We've been focusing this half hour on the floods and those in the fight against this water, like Lieutenant Sieber. We also want to let you know in our next hour and what's we'll have being done on the Internet. Well, if you don't know where a potential flood victim is right now and your family member, you can find out, hopefully, through the web. There are a number of sites that have databases set up from both the Moorhead and the Mayville State University sites, and they've got databases listing where the people are. There are also a number of sites that are like bulletin boards that you might find at, say, the local grocery store, only it's on the internet, and people are posting messages asking for information about people and also sharing some. I've got some messages up here I can show you. This is uh, from the Forum Communication site. That's a, a newspaper publisher there. I found this one touching. Agnes Reinstad has been a friend of my mother's for over 75 years. Years. My mother is anxious about where Aggie has been relocated to because she has severe physical limitations as a result of an earlier stroke. Mm. And it, then it has a, an email address that people can send if they have information. There are other people on this uh, bulletin board are asking about particular regions. Does anyone know what has happened in the Mighty Acres section? Um, and, and here's another one from people who are sheltering a family saying that, you know, here's where they are. So it's really just a, a lot of information sharing and uh, there are also some other sites like this one um, from KX4 Flood Talk that talks about the cleanup schedule, that it's uh, on schedule, and talks about what they're doing there in the community. Um, of course, the linchpin of these bulletin boards is you've got to hope that people see it, that enough people are online and can pass the news along, because this is obviously a little bit of desperation on the part of these families and relatives. Well, with all the telephone lines down, right. um, people are not being able to communicate with their families the way that they might want to, and so here it's sort of a, a pass the message along, and the internet becomes a very powerful tool to do that. And exactly that, a bulletin board. Mary Kathleen Flynn, thank you. An interesting angle on all this. That is our special edition of this broadcast for this evening. We thank you for being with us. Please stay with us for our usual hour of the news. Well, you think even the experts called it a 500-year flood. But wait, does that mean it's not likely to happen again for another 500 years? Tonight, the latest from Grand Forks and Rob Stafford tells us why many scientists say we may be seeing a lot more 500-year floods. Grand Forks, North Dakota, seems like a city frozen in time. Downtown, the streets are deserted, filled only with water, burned out buildings, and abandoned cars. Okay, um, drive forward. People yes, here left in a hurry, yes, and now you. they're in a hurry to return home. Being powerless is really tough. Deb and Marv Hodney thought they'd be gone only one night when they were evacuated a week ago, but they haven't been home since. As messy as it will be, and... and terrible to do the cleanup at least we'll be taking action right now we can't take any action that's really hard but going home may not be easy either Deb worries the flood may have destroyed her cherished family photographs late yesterday as the water receded authorities finally began letting some families inspect their homes the Hodneys Boy, were given just a few here. minutes to see the damage for the first time two three feet of water in the basement the couch is floating the pool table is soaked. Deb checks on her precious scrapbooks. They are high and they're dry. They're all okay. Now I might start to cry. We definitely will be able to, to come back and I think we're really lucky. I'm sorry. Not everyone will be so fortunate. Once floods come to this region, they don't go away quickly. They can't. Yeah, we're moving out. The Red River Valley is among the flattest parts of the country. With no place to drain, floodwaters stay put. 
In mountain valleys, floods pass through quickly, often reaching high speeds and leaving enormous damage in their wake. But in the flatlands of the plains, where there's simply nowhere for water to escape, floods grow out instead of up. Every extra foot over flood stage spreads water over a vast area. You can be in denial of this isn't happening. It's like a bad dream, but it's, it's real. The flood covers more than 1,000 square miles. This flood is spreading out over a huge area and moving through the valley very slowly. So because the valley is broad and gentle, the flood is uh, very extensive and it's going to last a long time. David Schimmel is a hydrologist with the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. We're having a, uh, a rather epochal flood as a result of a somewhat unusual combination of circumstances of weather and landscape. The main culprit behind this record flooding? Resting above all the flatland, this winter's record snows are now melting under the spring sun. Making matters worse are chunks of ice that have formed downstream. As the weather gets warmer, sheets of ice coating rivers begin to thaw, weaken, and break apart. Chunks of ice then rush downstream where they can jam up forming an ice dam. The water quickly builds up behind the ice, forcing rivers out of their banks. And some forecasters predict we'll see more of this in the future. They say global warming is causing more severe storms, which bring with them more water and hence more flooding. In North Dakota this evening, they're more concerned about the immediate future. The Red River now runs 14 miles wide in some places as the floodwaters head north from Grand Forks. In Pembina, just south of the Canadian border, residents constructed a sandbag fortress. Yeah, hey, need a couple more people here. And hope this would be enough to save them from the devastation they've seen in Grand Forks. Is there any way the disaster that devastated Grand Forks could have been prevented? Well, maybe. When the flood hit, the city was in the midst of analyzing an Army Corps of Engineers study recommending Grand Forks ring itself with a system of dikes and flood walls. The cost, $40 million. The latest estimate of flood damages, one and three quarter billion dollars. Now this is the beginning of time. Nonetheless, some rising is up. Some floods are so calamitous as to be unprecedented. Even river towns can be stunned sometimes, and Grand Forks, North Dakota was. The images will never be erased. The 500-year flood. The deluge that in an instant wiped away the legacy of generations of pioneers. The fire that turned downtown Grand Forks, North Dakota into a mangled pile of rubble. Yet now, a little more than six months later, there's life in the old town. Tim Holmes, the owner of Lola's, is back in action. The last time you were here, we hadn't been in here for a week and a half, and when we opened the refrigerator door, uh, you know, it was just a mess of muck and and that day we were cleaning that stuff out, I, I didn't know if we would, if the building was gonna be here. Back in April, Elliot Glassheim's secondhand bookstore was destroyed. He too was burned out. Well, I have two reactions, really. One is, uh, you know, really fatigued with the loss and kind of wanting to give up and not start anything again because it's too tiring. And the other is to say, well, that's a lot of weight, 70,000 books is a lot of weight off your shoulders, you go on to the next thing, go on to the next thing. Now, the next thing for Elliot Glassheim looks familiar. I'd like to get back in now, you know, I'm, I'm starting to collect them again and uh, looking for a place downtown to, to come back. Finding a place downtown is the rub. The rubble from the fire dominates the landscape even just across the street from the reopened Lola's. Like many businesses, the main bank has reopened, but out of town. And the reopening is still a rare enough occasion to pique the curiosity of even Mayor Pat Owens. This is great. 
Yeah, it's going to be know, this exciting. is really okay, nice. Could you put stuff on the floor. I like your location. It's a great location. Yeah. It's perfect. Yep. It's absolutely perfect. Far enough from the river, we hope, right? Wow, you bet. <laughs> Their story God, is typical. Linda and Mark Magnus lost everything. Well, that's right. See, I yeah. live upstairs now. Oh, do Because we lost our house, too, in the flood. So I live up there, which is why I'm here all night long. It's been a, it's been a hard road because there's a lot of hurt and there's a lot of uh, people who aren't settled. I think there's a lot and of fatigue right now. Right. A lot of fatigue after yep. six months that they're still not back in a house or that they're, you know, they go to get their Christmas decorations and there aren't any. Um. It's hard to believe that this is the source of so much turmoil. The Red River is calm, serene, barely flowing now. And across it in East Grand Forks, Minnesota, the neighborhoods are quiet, eerily quiet. It takes a few minutes to realize why. There's nobody home. These houses are in ruins. This community has been abandoned to the river. Everything will be torn down, and a new dike and a park that can absorb a flood will replace it. What's is yours? This blue one right here behind this tree. So this will never happen again. No, my garage is floating. I got to videotape the area when the whole city was closed off. And so we got to videotape where our church was and our house. Eric and Jennifer Stewart and their two children are among the 500 families still living in temporary trailers provided by FEMA. There's a bleak existence, a life in limbo. That's the exact word for it. We were living from place to place, from house to house, to, from on church floors, to people's floors, to, to beds, to campgrounds. To, it, was, it was everywhere uh, around the area, a place to stay, a place to sleep. 45, 50,000 people staying at, staying at the neighbors, you know, in the next city. It was kind of hard. What kept Eric and his family going was the kindness of strangers. We had wandered so long, and we, we had prayed about it, and, you know, of, you know, why. But then, before it was over, we, we saw good things come from, the, from all, all of what happened. People were kind, so kind to us. And they gave us um, clothes and food. Ruined by the flood, the Stewart's Church now meets at the North Dakota Museum of Art. It's something of an unlikely place for a fundamentalist Baptist church, but the congregants are grateful to have this place. It's dry. Oh. oh, my God. It's dry. Sunday morning has been here before. A few weeks after the flood, we accompanied the museum's director, Laurel Reuter, when she was allowed back well, for the first time yes, into the museum she founded. I stood right here and watched the water straight coming at me right in the eye, and that was when I didn't think we'd make it. Oh, terrific. She told us then that even though the paintings were dry, keeping the museum afloat financially in a community with so many other priorities would be a challenge. Cultural institutions are always fragile, and they become dispensable when you need food and you need housing and you need the basics. But Laurel Reuter has turned the museum she founded into an indispensable place, a place where all of Grand Forks, the cultural elite, the university folks, the poor and the plain all gather and for a while can forget what still has to be done outside. When I saw the state of the city and that so many churches had been destroyed, that so many public spaces had been ruined, that, that the community was, was ad adrift, I made a public announcement that the museum was open for ceremonial and religious purposes to anyone who needed it. Century, we have trials, certainly, that we face, and we've associated this with the, with the flood and some of the uh, events that have occurred during that time, and the principle that we've seen exist. So, here they all are this Thanksgiving season. Peter, Eric and Jennifer Stewart, Pastor Mike God's Custer, and the other members of the Bible Christ, Baptist Church. 
and it's not necessarily a bad thing. And after services, they're joined by dozens more for an old-fashioned prairie-style potluck supper. Smoked salmon. Oh. There you go. Restaurateur Tim Holmes brings a fresh smoked salmon. Pending used bookshop operator Elliot Glassine brings the turkey. Welcome everyone here today. And, uh, and after dinner, Mayor Pat Owens shows up for the free concert. I really have been so proud to be the mayor of a city where the people have had so much strength. And what a concert. Featuring the New York Metropolitan Opera's Corliss Euchre, who grew up here. She's accompanied by her husband, Jerry Grossman, who plays first cello for the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra. Laura Royer. I didn't know how important the museum was to its own people. I'm finding that this is a wonderful opportunity to bring art and life together. We will continue to do lots of social things because people need to come together and they need cultural life. I knew that, but I didn't know it as thoroughly as I know it now. What happened can never be forgotten, but it can it will be overcome in time by the people of Grand Forks. In the small city of Grand Forks, North Dakota tonight, they're taking time out from rebuilding their community to celebrate and with good reason. One year ago, floods virtually wiped Grand Forks off the map, but only for a moment. But through it all, the local newspaper kept right on publishing. Now, as NBC's Jim Avila reports, the Grand Forks Herald has won journalism's highest honor. The total destruction of an American city and its struggle to survive chronicled day by day in a newspaper that itself became the symbol of this town's will to rebuild. And today, one year after Grand Forks froze, thawed, flooded, and burned all in a week, solid hometown journalism wins a Pulitzer. I remember saying to them, we are going to publish this newspaper come hell or high water. And then the next morning, when we knew that the Herald had burned, the newsroom had burned, then we knew it was hell and high water, that we got it both. Mike Maidenberg publishes the Grand Forks Herald. The Red River swallowed his city, and the downtown fire leveled his newsroom. This is what burned, and uh, this is where the flames were shooting out into the sky, and all our photographs, all our clip files, everything were, uh, were destroyed. The Herald moved to a school outside the flood zone, filling the computer and music rooms with a staff of 220. And even though the city was evacuated, the power off, no drinking water or sewers, all 50,000 residents sent away. The Herald still ran the presses, never missing a day, distributing 117,000 papers every day, three times the normal circulation for free. In effect, transformed into a community newsletter, banner headlines overshadowed by personal messages inside, linking families and friends separated by the flood. Sylvia Bilden managed to keep track of her neighbors even though she moved 50 miles away to her brother's house. It was just reassuring and it just gave you a, a touch of touch with home. And now a new role for the Herald, cheerleader. The day after the fire, the water still running chest high in the middle of downtown streets, the building still smoldering, Grand Forks Herald made a snap decision that many people believe signaled the rebirth of downtown. They decided to build in the same spot, anchoring reconstruction. And it's working. Nearly 500 building permits have been issued, more than $45 million in new construction. And inside the afternoon news meeting, a new recognition that in times of crisis, 
good journalism does more than sell newspapers. Jim Avila, NBC News, Grand Forks. Also winning Pulitzers today and richly deserving them, Catherine Graham, the longtime publisher of the Washington Post for her biography, Personal History. After 22 novels, Philip Roth won his first Pulitzer for his work, American Pastoral, and the stark photos of the young children of parents addicted to drugs and alcohol won a Pulitzer for photographer Clarence Williams of the Los Angeles Times. April 14, 1998. They worked through blizzards and the flood of the century. And still, they published the paper. There was no possibility, no possibility, that we wouldn't publish a paper. And when their building burned... We would all say, well, it can't get any worse. And then it would. And 90% of the city was evacuated. Still, they published the paper. When they had a tangible thing to hold in their hand, the Grand Forks Herald, then they knew the Grand Forks were still alive and that the people were still there. Today, the world took notice. Tonight, come hell and high water. The story of the Grand Forks Herald. From ABC News. This is Nightline. Reporting from Washington, Ted Koppel. I love this story, and I hope you will, too. At a time when many, if not most Americans, question whether journalists in this country have lost their bearings altogether, whether we haven't become so full of ourselves that we've lost all relevance to the communities we serve, this story tonight is a real tonic. The Grand Forks Herald won a Pulitzer Prize today for public service. In our business, the Pulitzer is a very big deal indeed. But in this case, it is simply an affirmation of what the people of Grand Forks already know. Their community is served by some really fine journalists who prove beyond any shadow of a doubt that they know what a newspaper is meant to be and do. Grand Forks, in case you haven't looked at a map lately, sits between the Red River and the Red Lake River. When the town was founded in 1874, the location was an essential asset because river traffic serviced the town. Flooding was always a risk, but a necessary one. The Red River actually runs between Grand Forks, North Dakota, and East Grand Forks, Minnesota. That is, until April of last year. Then, it simply ran over everything and anything that stood in its way, including just about all of both towns. In a speech that he would deliver weeks later, the publisher of the Grand Forks Herald, Mike Maidenberg, said, Water washes away all that is non-essential. Flames burn away all that is superficial. What remains is a core, which, if strong and true, stands as a rock, despite flood and fire. We are a newspaper. What we do is publish. And despite overwhelming odds, that's what they did. Actually, this, uh, this area over here was, was jewelry. This was the cashier. These were the cashier's lines right here. It may not look like an ideal place for a newspaper staff unless you consider where the okay, people of the Grand Forks Herald have worked before. Then you might understand why an abandoned department store could seem like a godsend. We needed to get out of this little school that we were operating in in uh, Manville, North Dakota, and had the opportunity to, to come here, and this to us was heaven. I mean, uh, we had people crammed into... Uh, uh, you know, K through eight school, you know, side by side in those, you know, sort of adult fannies and little kids' chairs, and it was hot and very, very difficult. But our story starts earlier, in the winter of '97. If you check the Herald's records dating back to 1879, you'd see that the winter of '97 broke all records. So spring brought relief and fear as the Red River, swollen by melting snow, rose and rose. I mean, we knew there was going to be a bad flood, and we were filling millions of sandbags. 
we were Churchillian. You know, we're going to fight it on the front lines. We're going to beat it. We're going to hold the waters back because we, we've always done it before. The normal depth of the river is 15 feet. Never before had the Red River risen above 48 feet. Herald editor Mike Jacobs. The flood had behaved as forecast. If the flood had behaved as previous floods have behaved, we were absolutely prepared. We could have handled a flood of 51, 52 feet, but we couldn't handle a flood of 54, more than 54 feet. But it wasn't as if there was like a catastrophic dike break. It wasn't like a wall of water uh, came rushing down uh, the street. It was uh, more just this inexorable rise, this power of nature that could not be stopped no matter how many sandbags we laid and how high we, we raised the, uh, we, you know, we were frantically laying the secondary line of clay dikes. No matter how much we did there, this, the water kept coming, kept coming up and up and up until finally it was clear it, it couldn't be defeated. Everyone living in this neighborhood, you need to evacuate. You need to evacuate this area. And then the water swept into the city. They're going to lose their equipment if they're not careful. Around the dikes, through the storm sewer system, uh, over land, and the city was engulfed. Yeah, it looks like you got to get out of there. It was a domestic war zone that we were in, and uh, it, was a, it was a very, very uh, tense time. I did not accept the fact that my house would be flooded until I saw the water in the street. I mean, I, I actually saw the water coming over the dike in my neighborhood. I saw the water coming at my neighborhood from downtown. I saw water coming from both directions, and I thought, oh, there is going to be a flood. I mean, my house is going to be flooded. Herald reporter Liz Fetter. As the evening unfolded, I called the Herald at about midnight to talk to Mike Jacobs, the editor, because he wanted us all reporting for work at 6 a.m. or 7 a.m. the next morning, and I was going to tell him, you're crazy, Mike, we're not going to be able to use our building, there's going to be water all around it. He just picked up the phone and said, get down here. We were in uh, deep denial. I was still hoping that miraculously, like uh, Moses or somebody, that somehow the water would, would, would divide and go around us. Staff photographer Chuck wow. Kimmerly. I mean, it's like something you've never seen when the water starts coming up the street. And it's not like you can see it move when it, when it first hits the street. It, you know, you'll look at the water, it'll be at a certain point, you'll turn your head, you'll look back, it'll be a foot closer to you. We printed until about 2.30 in the morning on, um, on Saturday, April 19th, 1997. And then we abandoned ship. We, uh, the, the waters were coming down the alley, uh, we cut the power, we, we had to leave. When I left the Herald Building, I took only one thing with me. Uh, you know, I, I had absolutely no notion that I wouldn't be coming back. In fact, I had really intended to be back the next day. Maidenburg would return to the Herald a few hours later, but what a difference a few hours would make. He couldn't get within 300 yards of the Herald. Once that happened, at the newspaper, once it happened at the, um, uh, personally at my home at the same time later on that morning, then, uh, ha then comes this peculiar peculiar thing which is a sense of liberation and then your then the psychology changes to now I have to worry about the life that's ahead I have to worry about getting the paper out tonight for tomorrow worry about getting my home back in shape later on but the sense of of worry that you had pre-flood goes away and sort of this feeling that of of hey, I don't have to worry about that anymore. Now all I have to worry about is getting a newspaper out. That's great. That's really what I want to do. There was no possibility, no possibility, that we wouldn't publish a paper. We would have Xeroxed it. We would have mimeographed it if we had to. Um, it, it never occurred to us that we weren't going to publish. Because you have to do it. I mean, that's really what, what defines a newspaper and what defines a newspaper's relationship with its readers that it that it publishes uh, that we that we that you aren't stopped by you aren't stopped by government you aren't stopped by uh, dictatorship by censorship 
uh, and you're not stopped by a natural disaster. There was a need for a newspaper. There was a need for reliable information. And that's our business. And to not have stepped forward and done that work would have been, I mean, I, it's just, I can't imagine it. We put out a call on the radio on Saturday morning saying the Grand Forks Herald is going to publish. If you can hear this, if you can hear us, come to the uh, union of the uh, University of North Dakota at 2 o'clock. People were fleeing. You know, they were leaving. T they were leaving town. I remember walking up those stairs and wondering, what am I going to see in this in, at the Union here? Am I going to see just a big empty room, or or what? And there were 25 people there from the Grand Forks Herald. And then I said, we can do it. I know we can do it. This is ABC News Nightline, brought to you by Lexan. The Grand Forks Herald, like the city itself, was now under four feet of water its presses ruined. And that turned out to be the good news. I would say the real low point, I mean the time at which this city really hit its, our back was truly, truly to the wall, was on 415 on Saturday when the fire broke out. Not only did you have a city that it was flooded, but you had fire sweeping through its historic area, and it would eventually take down 11 buildings, including some of the more historic buildings in Grand Forks, and took down the Grand Forks Herald. You better be out of here in about 20 minutes. Firefighters battled the blaze waist deep in icy water, a toxic brew of mud, oil from underground tanks, and sewage. The sewer system in Grand Forks had flooded, sewers had backed up. Um, if you stopped to think what you're waiting around in, um, you would have become ill. Chief photographer John Stennis. We, we joked at the time, we would all say, well, it can't get any worse. And then it would. <laughs> and then again you'd say, well, it can't get any worse than this. And it would again. It burned our newsroom, burned our, uh, our operations uh, so that we lost uh, clips we lost our photo files. We lost our collective memory of the uh, of the of the community that we had in which we had published for over a hundred years. And that time, that was the time I think that we really hit bottom. But that's you know that's that's also a beginning. You know I mean when you when you're at when you're at bottom, you know it's like, what do you do? Do you uh, you know weep and moan and bewail your fate? or say, you know, I've got to get out of here, or this is, you know, you know it, 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 was a, it was a time of testing of character. Despite the stress and the fatigue, we had meaningful work to do. There were a lot of people whose stress and fatigue was worse because they were sitting in shelters. Their, their jobs were gone, you know, their businesses were not accessible, their homes were flooded, and they had, they sat there and worried uh, while we worked. And, you know, as between worry and work, you're better off with work. We had said to, to Knight Ritter, our parent company, if a disaster really hits here, we need to be with family. We need to be with our own uh, newspapers because they are, they're going to have to do things that families do for each other, which is sacrifice tremendously Apparently they're ordering a fairly general evacuation. The Herald was now operating from a nearby elementary school. The family the Herald leaned on was a neighboring paper in the Knight Ritter chain, the St. Paul Pioneer Press in Minnesota. What we did is we, we uh, commandeered computers from this little school in Manville, North Dakota. Uh, we could write our, we could get our stories in electronic form. We, we used the internet or email to send them to St. Paul. And so on the press of the, of the St. Paul Pioneer Press, we were able to create the Grand Forks Herald, 
but printing the paper was only half the problem. Circulation director Jim Fitch. And my first thoughts is, how can we possibly? How can I possibly do this? Um, I'm the only person that showed up from circulation that day, uh, and would be the only person from circulation for about three days because um, everybody else had evacuated. Ninety percent of the city's citizens had been evacuated. The papers were flown to different states and trucked by a loose network of drivers to whatever destination they could reach. So get them to the shelters, get them to the air base, get them to some of these universities, go to the small towns, drop them off at the gas station, drop them off at the mini marts, drop them off at the Dairy Queen. You know, get the papers out, they were all free. You know, get, get the paper out as far as you can and as fast as you can. And the, uh, the response was incredible. So even if you were in a shelter in Bemidji, Minnesota, and you were able to go and get a copy of the Grand Forks Herald, you sort of feel like you can hold it in your hands. There is some sense that this community is sticking together in some way. They were uh, dying for news as to what was happening. And when my drivers would shy, show up uh, with those papers, they couldn't, they couldn't keep people away from them. I mean, it was a mad rush to get them. And so there was this amazement. I remember, I remember walking around when the, with the first bundle as I was at the emergency operations center. This was like 11 o'clock on Sunday. Walking around, I felt like a, like a father with a, with a, you know, with, the, with, a, with a newborn. I was handing out cigars. Only I was handing out the actual paper. I was like, I was like handing out the, the child, you know, at the same time. And um, it, was, it, was, uh, it was wonderful. Our typical circulation is about 40,000 copies a day. So in the middle of the worst flood of the century, you were able to get out 120,000 copies That's of the correct. paper. That's correct. People told us that they had heard on the radio that, the, that Grand Forks had, had burned and flooded. Or they had seen a television clip that had burned and flooded, and they didn't know that there was a community there. But when the Herald appeared, when they had a tangible thing to hold in their hand, the Grand Forks Herald, then they knew that Grand Forks was still alive and that the people were still there. By April 28th, nine days after the fire and the worst of the flood, the bridge that spans the Red River, uniting North Dakota with Minnesota, reopened. The paper, meanwhile, would remain in the elementary school for another nine weeks. We've become different people. We've become a different newspaper. We've become a different city. And we will never forget that. We'll never forget the fact that at one, at one point in time, whatever it was, April 18th for some, 19th for me, maybe up, you know, another time, we realized that our future was going to be different than our past and that we were liberated from having to obey all the dictates of the past or even say, this is the way we've always done things and now we have to continue doing them that way. Well, everything could be challenged. We had a tough march, you know, uh, the, uh, the startup of the plant uh, happened a little bit later than we thought was going to happen, so we had to bear some additional printing expenses. Normal day-to-day -day is certainly back, and, um, you know, we're, we're back in our budget, we're worried about advertising revenue, we're worried about, you know, we're worried about everything that the newspapers uh, are, are always worried about. People took in during the flood. I believe that the future of newspapers is precisely what this newspaper was able to accomplish. Uh, but I can't show you increased circulation numbers. I can't show you increased profit numbers um, at this point. I mean, we're, you know, we're, having a, we're having a tough time as a business. But today there is a charge in the air. The staff scours the wires for news of the Pulitzer. Finally, they find the news they've been looking for. Yes! Yeah! All right. I've been laughing, crying, and screaming, and I didn't think I'd have such an emotional reaction to it. <laughs> this is awesome. Unbelievable. It, we're so excited. Um, it just an incredible day. It's more than we ever could have expected when we started this. Um, 
you know, uh, it never really entered our minds until a couple of days ago that it was actually a possibility we, we really would win. And to actually win is just wonderful. It's amazing. When you work for a small newspaper, especially one in North Dakota, uh, we're not exactly on the cover of editor and publisher American Journalism Review on a regular basis, so it means a great deal to this staff. As we toast each other and, and be, be happy here, you know, I think we also need to reflect, as, as I have over the, uh, over the bittersweet nature of this, of this award. It's wonderful that we've won it. We're here in a temporary building because we lost our building, and the city really lost a lot itself in the flood and the fire. And uh, it's not something that, uh, uh, that we would wish to happen again. Well, as I said uh, on the first day, we have to do it again tomorrow. <laughs> we don't expect to win a Pulitzer Prize for every day's newspaper, but we do expect to win the affection and loyalty of the readers in this part of the world every day. And that's our number one job. It's a more important job than winning the Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> but the celebration was short. They needed to publish tomorrow's edition. And you can guess what's on tomorrow's front page. Fabulous. What a great memory. And I'll be back in a moment. Tomorrow morning, Mike Jacobs, the editor of the Grand Forks Herald, will be a guest on Good Morning America. And that's our report for tonight. I'm Ted Koppel in Washington. For all of us here at ABC News, good. If you'd like a transcript or video cassette of this or any other edition of Nightline, please dial 1-800-CALL-ABC. Nightline has been a presentation of ABC News. More Americans get their news from ABC News than from any other source. ABC News, now always on. Friday night special. Don't panic, be calm, get to high ground, and See, know... No, mandatory evacuation. This is mandatory now. Everything in your power for get belongings. They mean nothing at this point. It was an April they'd never forget. And then all of a sudden, I looked over, and... A manhole cover got blown up into the air. <laughs> Woo! Beam me up, Scotty. Let me out of here. Third Street. Uh, the top, the, the roof of the building has been burned off. We never thought in our whole lives that we would ever be a part of, of something like this. When we come through this, if we can say we have lost no citizens, no people, we have won the battle. Tonight, after the flood, Stories from Grand Forks. From ABC News. This is Nightline. Reporting from Washington, Ted Koppel. Back on the 8th of April, it was Alabama where a single massive tornado killed 33 people. Yesterday, it was Tennessee, Kentucky, and Arkansas where a total of 11 people were killed by twisters. All in all, since February, those sudden violent storms have killed more than 100 across a range of nine southern states. But tonight, we're going to focus our attention for the second time this week on one of nature's rampages that took place exactly one year ago. And there's a measure of logic to that. Not that the dead can ever be replaced. They can't. But the survivors who, in the immediate wake of a natural disaster, may feel that they will never come back, never recover, never overcome the terrible feeling of loss. Those of you who may be watching tonight in Manila, Arkansas, or Metcalf County, Kentucky, or in Wayne County, Tennessee, we'd like you to see what can happen when members of a community reach out to help one another, as people did in Grand Forks, North Dakota, following the worst floods in anyone's memory. Nothing ever goes back to being the way it was before. And some parts of people's lives get bruised and damaged in ways that are never fully repaired. But allow yourselves a glimmer of hope. 
by looking at what happened to a community after the flood. I'm a downtown guy in Grand Forks, huh? I like to jokingly call an inner city guy. Last year at this time, Kim Holmes was tending to a different restaurant, a restaurant downtown. I thought there's two things I was never going to do, and that was have a restaurant in the south end of town in a strip mall, and here I am, having the best business I've ever had. So, just goes to show you, you don't know anything. <laughs> Last year at this time, Kim Holmes' life was about to change drastically. It was getting pretty tense. The weather service kept saying, well, uh, it'll crest at 48, 49 feet. And then all of a sudden, uh, weather service's uh, guesstimations kept getting higher and higher. And the Red River in Grand Forks is now expected to crest at 53 feet. I kept thinking, ah, oh, my, you know, my sandbag job worked, my sandbag job worked. Oh, what a fool. He decided to remain in his restaurant. And then all of a sudden, I looked over and a manhole cover got blown up into the air. <laughs> Woo! Beam me up, Scotty. Let me out of here. So I, I, I jumped in my car. My brother-in-law lives in the northwest part of town, and that's where my wife was. And so I says, well, enough of this macho crap. I'm getting out of here. You could stand up in your boat, and, and your chest would hit that awning, and the water was coming down this street, sometimes at a rate of 10 feet per second, and the water was moving so fast to the north that it created whitewater rapids. Bo Bateman was a volunteer rescue worker during the flood. If you're in a situation where you can't do anything about your own house, mine was flooded like everybody else, you want to be doing something. So it's, it's almost therapeutic to be working in the town. A lot of people would have given a lot to do what I was doing instead of just being able to stay with relatives and not, not lend a hand. I ran every stop sign in town for 12 days. Never dreamed I'd do that. So the water's really cold, and then, bear in mind, it's coming here through all those neighborhoods. There's propane tanks that are floating. A uh, couple of boats escaped, and they were going down the river, and anything you can imagine. I tried to come back the next morning, and the National Guard caught me and says, you can't go down there. I says, why not? I, I've got uh, to check on my building and my restaurant. It's underwater, pal. I says, what? You know, yeah, you're... you're it's underwater, and the water's four or five feet deep down there. I said, get out of here. Yeah, get, and you get out of here. The water was over my knees. It was going so strong that I got out of the Humvee, and I almost got sucked down. And I had to hold on to a pole and, you know, work my way in. And I made the mistake of looking in the front window. Well, it just tore me up. I started bawling, and I just lost it. The floodwaters set off electrical fires in downtown. The roof of the building has been burned off. You can see the flame coming through from a couple floors down there. Flames coming from the main level as well, uh, coming on almost every one of the windows. Kim's building was spared, but Grand Forks would eventually lose 11 buildings. We never thought in our whole lives that we would ever be a part of, uh, of something like this. This only happens to other people. It doesn't happen to us. Craig and Melissa Silvenagel lost their apartment, everything they own. Den window in our bedroom window. Scott and was there. just a few blocks away, Craig's advertising business was in jeopardy. I don't know what's going to happen uh, if my business is not burned. I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, a big part of our clientele were local businesses. Um, you know, what happens to, to you know, the, the physical business is there, but what about the business to run the business? I don't know what happens when we get back. They were being sustained, they said, by the generosity of family friends and strangers. I know that in one case in particular, um, um, one individual called to see a Tony um, to find out my size, my pants size. And um, three pair of jeans were in a bag that was uh, made to look like they were used pants. Um, they were brand new. That's, um, that's kind of people that um, have been taking care of us, so we're okay. And another potential loss, the home they had hoped to buy. 
I, I think um, if there's one thing right now that we can hope for is that we get to back, back to Grand Forks, yes. we go to 1028 Belmont Road, we find that the basement's full of water and um, that the top floor is bone dry, and we clean that basement out and we move in and we start rebuilding. More on the Sylvan Eagles and Kim Holmes a bit later in the broadcast. But first, when we come back, one farmer struggled to save his livelihood. This is ABC News Nightline. They were um, in that, between those two trees right over, right over there. Western Minnesota in early April 1997 would give Grand Forks a glimpse of what it would soon face. Here, the rivers that laced the landscape flooded, then froze, turning farmland into lakes as deep as five feet, covered by a layer of ice. Farmer Ken Visser had already lost dozens of pigs to flooding. He had reason to fear for his cattle. Well, everything is ice between here and there, and we're kind of afraid that the cattle are, will try and cross it and fall in, and there's not really a whole lot they can do once they fall through ice. Shoot, there's one of them in already. I gotta go, there's one in over there. For five hours, Ken worked to free nine cattle. <laughs> but three ground. We don't dwell on these things. You really don't have time. Uh, uh, it's something that's it's gonna be etched in our memories for as, probably as long as we live. He needed a good crop in 97, he said. It didn't happen. Always felt that the flood wasn't gonna be a determining factor uh, on whether I wanted to farm or not, but uh, it's uh, the, uh, the struggles we're having now that's, I think that's, causing me to uh, feel that it's, it's time. Ice was a factor in the Grand Forks flood too, increasing the severity of flooding by blocking the flow of water. 90% of the city was evacuated. Few houses were spared, not even the mayor's house, or so she thought at the time. As I talked to you this morning, my own home is going under uh, it may not be total, but now I am in the same bucket with the rest of you. When we went back, concrete wall was cracked, so we had, that was from the force of the water, so I know the water was there, but I had not gotten a drop of water. We did not get water. So people teased me because I said I felt so guilty, but I knew I, I mean, I just, I didn't have time to think about it because I had so many people to take care of, and so many of the people have just said, well, the Lord knew. Uh, what you could handle and he'll only give you so much and you had all you could take and I you know I have dug in really deep to help other people so I don't feel guilty anymore Liz Fetter covers city government for the Grand Forks Herald Immediately on a national level there was a lot of compassion for the people of Grand Forks because here you had this five-foot-tall mayor who had been the mayor's secretary for 32 years who was suddenly in charge of getting her city through the worst natural disaster in the history of the state of North Dakota. President Clinton came to see the disaster area for himself and to offer hope to the flood victims. And I was told I was gonna give the main talk at the table and I thought, oh my goodness. And, but you know, I didn't have time to be frightened or afraid or say, you know, this is the president. I was talking to an individual that could give hope to our people and that's how I treated it. You coming today, Mr. President, you bring us hope. When I did give the talk that day, it wasn't very hard for me to give because I looked at the people in the audience and the hurt on our people's faces. They were all displaced and families were separated and nobody knew what was gonna happen. Uh, that's when I said, you know, buildings do not make a community. It's the people and the faith and spirit that are in those people that make a community. And I told someone the other day that when Pat was lobbying in Washington and meeting with all of these male politicians, and when she spoke with HUD Secretary Andrew Cuomo, she looked him in the eye and said, I have complete faith in you. I know you're going to do what's right for my community. And I think these men would have felt guilty if they hadn't helped her. I didn't cry during the flood. You were like you were almost in a state of shock. 
And I had an opportunity on Sunday to go to St. Peter, Minnesota. And that's where they, Peter, St. Peter and Comfrey, Minnesota, where they suffered the tornadoes over the weekend. And when I saw their cities, then I cried because it's all over again in a different form. And it's, um, when I was going through it, you and our city, you are so intense on making sure your people are cared for that you, uh, you don't think of anything else. And it's just been, like I said, emotionally, physically, financially draining to everyone. But the citizenry of the city just amazed me because they've hung in there. And uh, they just said, we'll do it. And uh, I slept for a couple of days and, and uh, you know, cursed a little bit and, and uh, you know, woe is me kind of stuff. But uh, then now it's enough. Get, get it out of your system and go after it. And, and so we did. Restaurant owner Whoa. Kim Holmes. <laughs> Ooh, baby. Honey, you know what I like. One ice machine. That's what I like. Yeah, well, I guess that's uh, special for today. <laughs> uh, my whole crew, God bless them. Um, you're only as good as your staff. And so we mucked it out, and uh, boy, they <laughs> pissed and moaned about it. But they were there every day. Isn't that right, honey? Yeah. Really got to love me to do this stuff, huh? <laughs> the federal government gave $172 million to Grand Forks to help the town rebuild. The Commerce Department awarded them another $3 million today. Joan Kroc, heir to the McDonald's fortune, offered up to $2,000 for almost every homeless family in the Grand Forks area, a fact not forgotten by the townspeople, a preview of a concert to be performed on the anniversary. When we come back, a new home for Craig and Melissa Silvernagel, and a new life. So we lost about 750 homes in the flood, and we'll probably lose about another 300 with the dike lined. And it's real sad, I can't even, at this point, sometimes uh, can't even drive through those neighborhoods because it, it's uh, depressing. The Lincoln Drive neighborhood hit worst by the flood is eerie, a ghost town. Some signs lean against abandoned houses, others are spray painted. Former rescue worker, Bo Bateman. There was one that said, we aren't what we own. It was written on a big pile of garbage in front of the houses, you know. I've tried to keep spirits up and tried to be positive, but there are days that uh, you need to uh, just turn away from it and do your job and not look at it because it's uh, very hard to take. So I believe the sooner that we can get that done, the better it's going to be because then people can go on with their lives and they won't forget, but at least it isn't a daily reminder. 200 families are still homeless in the Grand Forks area. Many of these live in what's called FEMAville, a trailer park on the outskirts of town named for the Federal Emergency Management Agency. The trauma of the flood is still present. In the last um, part of 1997, which was about six months post-flood, we saw a very dramatic increase, about a 47% increase in our abuse and rape crisis program. That really points to national trends that show that six months after a disaster is when a community is really suffering and some of the after effects really start taking place. 
Hi, Kathy. It's Janelle Regenball. I'm and with the anniversary of the flood, calls to community mental health lines are surging. The stress of, of the last year has been quite high for a number of people. And when you're under a lot of stress, sometimes you abandon your usual coping mechanisms that have worked. Or you just don't take the time to do some of the healthy things you used to do. Craig and Melissa Silvernagel were lucky, though. Oh, goodness. That's right. Um, the senior citizen's bus number was After changed. weeks of living with Melissa's parents, they bought the house they wanted. It had been spared major flood damage. It's nice to have a place to live, and uh, we're, we're pretty fortunate. There's a lot of folks uh, that are still, uh, still suffering without a home and, and uh, don't know where they're going to be, and so we're, we feel pretty lucky. And another thing. Well, yesterday, we took them for a little walk. Two-week-old Sam. I don't know if I'd call him a flood baby, but he's pretty darn close. It was kind of overwhelming at first. The focus in my life now is not how much money can I make and, and how can I build up my company and really it's to, is to make a living and to be able to spend time um, where I want to spend time and that's with, with my wife and with my son. You gonna have something to eat, Paul? Okay. Kim Holmes was able to open a new restaurant in a different location seven weeks after the flood. A community that my customers that came in and really stepped up and says, what can we do for you? I will never walk by a Salvation Army Christmas bell ringer without dropping folding money in there. I mean, first of all, being in the kitchen, they had the best food. As part of a special issue, the Grand Forks Herald plans to run another edition of The Grid, a kind of community bulletin board that allowed friends and family to connect with one another during the flood. But this grid will be different. This one will give citizens the chance to say thank you. Who would you say thanks to? The whole town. What can you say? There's not a not a person that I've come in contact with in this community, from guys pumping gas to checkers in the in the in the grocery store that don't have a smile on their face and and uh, you know everybody, uh, the mayor still smiling, God bless her, and uh, you know our city council, nobody signed on for this gig, no one, and they're all there and they're all working their tails off and doing the best they can. And this community, if you didn't believe in it before the flood, if you don't believe in it now, you don't belong here. I mean, these people are great. The best. That's it. I feel so welcome each time that I return That my happy heart keeps laughing like a clown I love those dear hearts and gentle Hello, I'm Mike Maidenberg, publisher of the Grand Forks Herald. In April of 1997, disaster struck Grand Forks, North Dakota and East Grand Forks, Minnesota. A massive flood forced evacuation of both communities. The Red River was still rising when fire tore through the historic heart of Grand Forks. The world we knew was changed forever in just days. To rebuild will take years. The good news is that great progress has been made in both our physical and psychological reconstruction. Throughout the ordeal, volunteer effort has been extraordinary. Despite fits and starts, federal, state, and city governments performed well. We're grateful for the assistance from communities around North Dakota and Minnesota, and from help that came from Americans everywhere, including a unique gift made by a woman who came to be known as the Angel. There is a mountain of work remaining, but we are confident in our future. The watchword is that our community and the newspaper which serves it will come back bigger, better, and stronger. In short, we are reinventing ourselves. The photographs you are about to see tell a tale of disaster and recovery. The images include some of the most dramatic photographs published in the Grand Forks Herald or any newspaper. 
Many have entered forever into the public imagination as symbols of the human condition. Disaster, despair, unity, hope, triumph. The story of the flood of 1997 begins with the winter that led up to it. It was the worst of times. Seven blizzards had hit us through March and it was becoming hard to find a place to put all the snow. Yet it was the best of times. The Fighting Sioux of the University of North Dakota took the NCAA Division I Hockey Championship. And it was the worst of times, as an April blizzard the Herald named Hard-Hearted Hannah became our eighth of the season, snapping power poles and adding a foot to the already record snowpack. We knew the spring melt would be dangerous. The river's highest crest prior to 1997 was 49 feet. On April 15th, one week after Blizzard Hannah, we told readers to brace themselves. By the 17th, the Red River of the North crossed into record territory and began what would be an inexorable rise that overwhelmed all our defenses. Grand Forks knows how to fight floods. For weeks prior to the melt, the entire community was mobilized in preparation. Up and down the riverfront, we began an around-the-clock sandbagging effort. We laid miles of sandbags in an effort to raise and reinforce the existing clay dikes beneath. There were some remarkable engineering feats accomplished both on dry land and in the icy river when that became necessary. The two weeks we spent laying dikes were a long, exhausting, and ultimately futile effort. On Friday, April 18th, the disaster dawned. This was our paper that day, the second to last we printed in our downtown plant. That same day, the river came over the dikes protecting our community, spilling first into the low-lying areas like this one in the Lincoln Drive neighborhood. This is a view of the entire Lincoln Drive area. As its dike failed, others too were overtopped. The around-the-clock battle to save the city was lost. This was our edition on Saturday, April 19th. It would be the last paper printed on our press downtown. The flood slowly filled nearly the entire city. Water reached to main floors and in many cases to rooftops. Those who didn't leave at first warning had to evacuate by canoe or by motorboat or by the National Guard truck called the Deuce and a Half. Coast Guard rescue missions were launched along tree-lined streets and the water created macabre and horrifying scenes. The Red River burst out of its normally narrow channel to become a vast lake which engulfed our community. But flood was not the only tragedy to befall us. On the afternoon of Saturday, April 19th, fire broke out in the flooded downtown. The source was located in the same block as two of our three buildings. The night of April 19th and the morning of April 20th, those two buildings burned. A fireman snapped this shot of our second floor newsroom in flames. We lost our clips, our photo files, our collective memory of 118 years of publication. Fire trucks were of little use. The blaze was fought mostly from the air using forest fire techniques. For three eerie days, we were a community whose historic heart was under aerial bombardment. The main Herald Building, an Art Deco classic constructed in 1931, did not burn. But the three feet of water that invaded it washed out our advertising department and silenced our press and mailroom. On Tuesday, April 22nd, the river crested. That same day, Knight Ritter CEO Tony Ritter and I went down to the newspaper and ships, actually a boat furnished by the State Game and Fish Department. Our destroyed buildings looked like they had undergone artillery shelling, as did the entire downtown area. Help arrived swiftly. The president and his cabinet flew in. Clinton would soon introduce a massive relief bill for flood victims. Mayor Pat Owens became a national symbol of caring and determination. And so we told our readers. Thousands of volunteers arrived from all around the country, including 254 men and women from Knight Ritter newspapers. This is Mike Cassidy from the San Jose Mercury News. Over 90% of our community evacuated to places like this hangar at Grand Forks Air Force Base. They stayed there for days, in some cases for weeks, doing what they could to keep their spirits up. And then the cleanup began. 
Residents came back to scenes that were horrifying and heartbreaking. Fortunately, we didn't lose our sense of humor, despite daunting evidence of the river's destructive power. Just getting roads open was a major task. Here, an emergency clay dike blocked the bridge to our sister city of East Grand Forks, Minnesota. The furniture, fixtures, and belongings that represented the accumulated lives of so many friends and neighbors lined city streets for weeks, and then wound up at the city landfill. We dumped the equivalent of six years of trash there. By the way, we've declared Grand Forks a shag carpet free zone. At the paper, we had our own cleanup to tackle. That's our sign on the ground. Everywhere editor Mike Jacobs turned was devastation. Our two buildings that burned had been restored in 1993 and were landmarks in downtown Grand Forks. Yet we suffered the same fate as so many others. Flood water entered our press room in the early hours of Saturday, April 19. It would reach to the top of the folder of the press. We were able to print two thirds of our 40,000 run before we were forced to abandon ship. The press room clock stopped at 2.26 a.m. when we cut power to the building. We had no time to despair. We had a paper to put out. On Saturday, we pulled our staff together and operated out of this computer lab at the University of North Dakota. We emailed stories to our sister newspaper in St. Paul, which printed the paper that we flew back and distributed. At the same time, we kept our website, Northscape, updated. On Sunday, April 20th, with the city flooded, its downtown smoldering, and its newspaper burned, to the amazement and gratitude of our readers, we published this edition. It included a front page editorial headlined, The Day That Changed Everything. But once again, we had no time to pause. The threat of more flooding and the reality of no sanitation or drinking water forced us to leave the university. We set out for the small community of Manville, North Dakota. Several of our employees lived in Manville, a farm town of 350 population, 10 miles north of Grand Forks. It had a modest elementary school, but inside we knew was a well-stocked computer room, three phone lines, drinking water, and toilets that flushed. The principal, Richard Ray, welcomed us, as did the entire community. Mr. Ray said he wanted to be a good neighbor. We considered him a saint. He thought the Herald would be there a week. We stayed for two months. When the Herald arrived with its 150 plus employees, we transformed the place. The computer room became our newsroom. Our circulators took over the health room. Not everything was immediately relocated to Manville. Back in Grand Forks, we found a way to move business computers from the second floor of the standing but powerless Herald building to a garage of one of our IS technicians. There, next to the washer, dryer, and freezer, was our circulation information system and our ad billing system, which we were able to network to Miami. Housing was an immediate challenge. We placed our people and visitors in many churches, basements, spare rooms, and this instant RV park in Manville. At its peak, we had 19 sites located along Ritter Drive North. The school was our home for two months. We set our editorial strategy in the computer room. One end of the school library became our conference area, finance office, and lunchroom. The other end turned into our planning department as we struggled day in and out to become masters of our situation. Manville continued to hold classes. We shared the halls and the cafeteria line with kids and teachers. The students wrote us cheering and affectionate letters, which helped us keep up our spirits. We responded in kind, giving different grades a page in the paper to write about what they were experiencing. In the end, Manville Public School and the Grand Forks Herald shared a single identity. Here's our family photograph, a copy of which we gave to everyone shown. From this school, we produced one spectacular newspaper after another, featuring stunning photography. This shot became the signature image of the flood. It shows ground zero, the building where the fire broke out. And this is how it was used with the classic headline of Monday, April 21. 
A week later, the bridge between the two states opened. Our photograph became the symbol of unity. On April 29th, a spectacular rainbow occurred over downtown. It became a symbol of hope for the entire community. This was the same day that the gift of the angel, McDonald heiress Joan Crock, was announced. So, where are we now? Well, two months after the flood, our two high schools finally got their prom, held at Grand Forks Air Force Base. The band Soul Asylum played. The Herald left Manville at the end of June 1997, returning to Grand Forks where the news was happening. We moved into a vacant retail store. The roof leaked and mosquitoes attacked, but it was good to be home. The best building turned out to be a decent place for a nomadic newspaper. In the front, there was lots of open space for offices. In the back, where the store's warehouse was, we erected a community press and a mailroom seemingly out of thin air. We have now constructed two new buildings. This is the production plant four miles west of downtown. It was dry land in 1997. It has an 11 unit press, three more than in our press room downtown. It's modern and spacious, about 40,000 square feet in size. We began printing here on March 17, 1998. Downtown, we constructed a clock tower addition to the 1931 building, which did not burn. The tower has become a landmark on the skyline of the city's new downtown. It's the home for our editorial and business offices. We moved in July 17, 1998. The tower is lit on all four sides. Its glow gives confidence and hope to all who see it. On April 14, 1998, the Herald received national recognition for its performance during the flood. We were awarded the Pulitzer Prize for Public Service. Of all the newspapers we published, it is this one that will always focus our energies. It is not just that it carried a headline and image that burned into the national consciousness. Rather, it expresses a promise that we believe is the force driving the mission of the Grand Forks Herald and indeed every newspaper in this country. We are proud we created it, and we are dedicated to living up to it. Before I close, a few final comments. Our parent company was superb. Knight Ritter's swift response helped stabilize our community and provided timely aid for our employees. Knight Ritter set up an employee relief fund to which it contributed $250,000 and which grew from other contributions around the company to $325,000. We were able to help 78 employees, over a third of our workforce, with cash grants averaging $4,000. When a company like Knight Ritter marshals its resources behind a common goal, the result is awesome. I am sometimes asked when Grand Forks will be back to normal. The easy answer is to say five years, give or take. That's the time frame all the disaster experts project. They add that during those years, we should expect clashing plans, competing projects, and warring emotions. They've been proven right. We're seeing all the frustrations that disaster recovery brings. But the hard answer is never. Grand Forks will never be the kind of place it once was. We will be a changed community for better or for worse. I, for one, am certain we will be a better place. The Herald, by publishing throughout the disaster and by being the first major industry to rebuild downtown, is leading our community to that better future, while at the same time covering all the controversy. It's a process that is exhausting and fascinating, yet I am convinced it will be the most rewarding time in the lives and careers of all of us who live in a community and work at a newspaper where people acting together triumph over the worst that nature could deal out. When the history of Grand Forks is written, this spirit will mark a turning point. Thank you for spending this time with us.
Some money. 1960 for the 59 tornado. Tornadoes were in 57. Seven. Yeah, yeah it was 57. Yeah. They wanted to light up. When I saw Jeff Fetch, <laughs> oh, this is like a folder. We could do it now if you put it out. We actually were able to get into B's hands. And I don't, I don't know that everybody knows what Jim did. You know, we were putting out, we were putting out the paper and trying to figure out what we're actually doing. that we could imagine possible. That we were flooded, our press was flooded, our, our building was burned, and yet we were able to produce a newspaper to serve our community. And as we toast each other and, and be, be happy here, you know, I think we also need to reflect, as, as I have over the, um, over the bittersweet nature of this, of this award. It's wonderful that we won it. We're here in the temporary building because we lost our building, and the city really lost a lot itself in the flood and the fire. And uh, it's not something that, uh, uh, that we would wish 
to happen again. I mean, if we if we wanted this, if we if we were going to choose our our our, our fate, we wouldn't have cho chose it this way. But it happened, and we responded mag magnificently. And I think we actually helped the community stay together and to pull itself together and get ready to to grow into a much better community than it than it ever has or ever has been before. So with this toast, I'd like to uh, salute everybody of the Grand Forks Herald and all our friends and neighbors in the Grand Forks, greater Grand Forks area, and our friends from around Knight Ritter and from around the country. Uh, we do appreciate this wonderful award, and uh, we'll just try to be worthy of, of, of living up to it. So thank you, America. Well, how cheap is that blazer, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> do it, do it. I want word. How inexpensive is it? <laughs> do it. Tradition, yeah. tradition, right. tradition, here, tradition. Here's here is to the greatest newspaper staff in America. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the opportunity to work with all of you, for the opportunity to cover a story like this, to be ready to cover a story like this, and then to share in the recognition that doing it well brings us. Thank you all. It's really a great staff. I'm proud of each and every one of us, and I thank every one of you for what you did to make this happen. Thank you. It would not be complete as, as we started back there without recognizing Jim Fetch and circulation. Because a newspaper is more, I mean, the newspaper is its reporters, its staff, its people, what we put in the newspaper. But until we get it delivered uh, to people and get it into their hands and, and uh, they, can, they can read it, we haven't completed the circle that we start when we put the newspaper together. Jim, Todd did a fabulous job. Uh, I remember uh, that Saturday afternoon when we were uh, at the union trying to figure out how are we going to get this paper delivered. Where are where have our people gone? And uh, we knew there were refugee areas. We knew that uh, people had gone to the air base. But we had to set up a overnight distribution system. And it was Jim and his folks who did that. And at one time, I think as we all know, at one time we were our, we were producing three or four times as many papers as we ever produced because the demand for the Grand Forks Herald was so huge. And we got that paper out to every. Uh, gas station, every convenience store, every refugee camp, and people asked us, can we get it here? Well, we've got it there the next day. Uh, we put that paper out in ways that we had never thought we ever could possibly do. So here is a salute and a thank you to Jim Fetch and the folks from Circulation who really came through for us uh, in, uh, in, in that disaster that we all faced together. Jim? <laughs> Well, obviously, I just um, just thrilled to be part of this newspaper. It was uh, it was trying times, and Todd Phelps was fabulous at helping us get the paper out. And everybody, including Don Zimney, uh, Beth Bowman, the whole the whole circulation crew did an outstanding job. And we were just glad to be able to get the paper out. Uh, the fantastic paper that was written all those days, and just glad to be part of it. Okay, Great. salute. All right. All right. I want to say thanks to Mike Jacobs. Thank you. At six o'clock at the hub. Uh, pizza on the Herald. Drinks will be on me up to a reasonable limit. Uh, they're expecting us. Uh, the hub is back. And uh, they're expecting us at six o'clock. So everybody's welcome. Please don't think that this is an invitation just for the newsroom. Everybody should come. It's a great party for everybody involved at the Herald doing this incredible time. Six o'clock at the hub. Uh, for those of you who can't remember where the hub is, <laughs> it's, it's just across from the Herald building downtown uh, on, on North 3rd Street. So uh, please be there at 6 uh, and we'll have a party. I want to I offer one more toast while, while, we're, uh, while we're here together. Um, those of you who have seen the slideshow know that 
one of the slides shows a garage. I'm not sure whether it was Dewey's garage or, or Mark's garage. Mark, Mark. It's Mark's garage. But there we had the washer, the dryer, the CIS system, <laughs> the, um, the advertising billing system. Uh, Dewey and his, I call them the commandos, when they, they went into town, uh, really before we were supposed to get into town, we pulled our computers out, we got them safe, we made sure they were okay, they were okay, set them up in the garage, in, uh, in Mark's garage, linked it to Miami. There's another way that we were up and running as a newspaper and did not let, uh, did not let a challenge like the city was flooded and we couldn't get into our building really deter us. We, we, got there, we got there on some pretty big vehicles, and we got the stuff out. And Dewey, Mark, Terry, the folks from IS did a tremendous job in keeping us, uh, keeping us going. So here's a toast, Dewey, to you and your commandos. Thank you. Right. How many of them are there today? <laughs> Not enough. <laughs> well, as I said uh, on the first day, we have to do it again tomorrow. <laughs> we don't expect to win a Pulitzer Prize for every day's newspaper, but we do expect to win the affection and loyalty of the readers in this part of the world every day. And that's our number one job. It's a more important job than winning the Pulitzer Prize. So that's the job we have to go back and do now, <laughs> before 6 o'clock, uh, so that we have a product for readers, uh, for readers tomorrow. And uh, uh, naturally, we'll all be back on Wednesday to do it again. So again, thanks. Thanks to, thanks to all of you, to all the people who came in to help. It's a great day. It is. It's a wonderful day. Harold and for all of us. Thanks all. Get him. I can't, I can't, not the white shirt guy. <laughs> Look out. St. Paul, it is about two Grand Forks at that particular time was about seven and a half hours. You did that every day? We did that every day. Uh, about 300 miles. How long did you do that? You did that for, uh, before we went to press, we started printing the cargo. That was probably a we driving the trucks about three weeks after the flood. Yeah, we, I mean, then, then we continued, and then we still brought portions of the vapor back from St. Paul. Nothing you've ever done with Peggy. 
Nice form there, know. Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Who am I going to point to? Chuck is here. Who is? Who is? Who is? Who is? Who is? Who is? Did you see a bopping push in here? Who is? Who is? <laughs> Good, John. Good one. You're next. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that stinks. I know it smells like. What the hell is this? It's up all three. So that won't be sticky. Let's put this in. Let me get one out here. No, we all want to call the service. No, but oh, I didn't know if Eric was. Hey, it's a cupcake. Right, we know what it's like. Not specifically. I got more candies. So that was. So that's what it's like. Right, when you get it. What department's lying? There's a horrible ice water. This guy. Well, I can't remember. This is like socks. Those are gorgeous. Those are gorgeous. All right. Don't do it. All right, there. Oh, God, it's empty. <laughs> Thank God. Jeez. <laughs> oh, no. He didn't see me do that. <laughs> Look it up. I I go, I go, Jack. <laughs> do one more. Do one more. One more, Charles. One more. One more. Keep your mother. Keep your mother. Okay. Is this autofocus or not? Oh, thumb. I'm here. Oh, you got it. Okay, fine. Yeah, it's set on the thumb focus. <laughs> All right. I hope they turn out. This is in the back warehouse of the Best Building. And this is the community press that we printed the Grand Forks Herald on, part of the Grand Forks Herald, while part of it was sent to Fargo. And this press will soon be leaving the building. Yes, I am. And there's Mac. There goes Mac. If ever a group of people deserve the Pulitzer Gold Medal for public service, it's all of you. This past year, whenever I've been asked to speak about the future of newspapers, I have proudly told audiences about the superb work you did in the face of so many daunting challenges. It was a year ago, nearly to the day, that the Herald's real room was underwater, its presses caked in mud, its newsroom reduced to ashes. But none of that mattered. The Herald is not a building of presses. The Herald is people. As each of you proved, people with fierce commitment to serving their community can make a difference. All of you, by making sure the Herald never missed an edition, by making sure your work was so thorough and reliable, made it possible for the Herald to help Grand Forks connect and re reconnect and rebuild. Come hell and high water, you did what great people, uh, newspaper people do, and then some. Uh, congratulations. And then, in handwriting underneath, the true sentiment, I'm damn proud of all of you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Boring. It's Jim Durkin, everybody! just feels so fabulous to have other people in journalism nationally saying that you really serve your readers. And when your whole community was obliterated, when there in fact was no community and people weren't living there, that people at the newspaper hung tough 
and we were able to produce a newspaper every day, and so some semblance of community remained. People were able to hold that newspaper in their hands and find out what was happening in town, what was happening with their neighbors, and that at some point we were going to be able to rebuild. Tell me about some of the devastations I reported. I can recall the day that President Clinton was here, which was on a Tuesday of the day, that the river in fact did crest at 54 feet. And I was in a plane with the Minnesota and North Dakota governors and the cabinet. And when we flew over the towns, what was amazing is everybody was wiped out. And so the flood was a great leveler. It didn't matter if your house was $300,000 or $40,000. Everybody suffered. And it's just really strange to see a ghost town underwater, no activity at all, and then think, how in the world are these communities going to survive? Financially, what are we going to do? Emotionally, how are people going to cope? But it really helped that so many people around the United States showed that they cared right away. And about 10 days after the flood hit, the anonymous angel from California surfaced, and out of the blue, gave $15 million to people who were strangers, people she had never met. Yet she felt the connection to our communities on television, and I think her generosity in people all around the United States who made small...
guests on behalf of the city of Grand Forks, I am very, very pleased to call you our hometown paper. I uh, had a call from one of the press today, which I won't name right here, and telling me about this award. And uh, I told them, I said, wow, I said, that is absolutely great. And they said, a government official saying the newspaper's great? And he laughed. And I said, well, you don't have to agree all the time. It's just like a family. You don't always agree. But I think you're great. I saw Mike Maidenberg uh, at his best and at his worst, and he saw me the same. I saw him, his home was gone. The next morning he came in and I said, oh Mike, the building for his printing was gone, and he still kept in there, and all his employees the same. Uh, so that shows the kind of determination we all need to keep going and move forward to make our communities a place to be proud of. And I told uh, all the news media across the nation, one of the things with the Grand Forks Herald was it was our only sense of a normal positive for many days. They'd stack them out in the emergency center, and I couldn't wait to get there in the morning so I could grab my two copies. And that kept myself as mayor and everyone else in contact when we couldn't communicate. So uh, you are to be highly commended, and I know there's been a lot of sweat put into what you did during that flood, and I know a lot of you put in some long hours, but I can't tell you how proud we are of you and how good this is for our city as a whole and our entire community. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I've told Mike Maidenberg many times that I tell people all over the state that as far as I'm concerned, there is no better paper in the entire state than the Grand Forks Herald. I really believe that. And not only do they have fine content, but they showed during the flood that they were really an exceptional and outstanding group of people. I, too, on behalf of the Chamber, want to congratulate you on the Pulitzer. It is a wonderful, wonderful honor that you bring to your paper, your wonderful staff, but also to the city. On occasion, people have said, Bob, you survived the flood. And I always correct them. I am not a survivor. Survivors only come back like they were. I'm a winner. And that's the way I view this community and the Grand Forks Herald as well. We did not just survive, we won. And to have the Pulitzer today in this beautiful building tells us that that's exactly what happened. We're immensely proud of you. Congratulations, Mike, to you and all of your crew. On behalf of the Chamber, we thank you for your contribution to our community, and we look forward to many wonderful years. Thanks, Bob. At first, we thought this was going to be just the opening of, of, a, of a new building, which is a spectacular building. Uh, really. Uh, modernized our press and our mailroom operations, something that we've longed to do for many, many years. But it happened on the same day that the uh, Pulitzer Prize was announced, and I couldn't help but think, as actually as I was talking to folks back in the paper, about the year that has been, and they're talking to us about the year of closure, that it's been a year since the flood, on Sunday will be the actual year, and that we need to, um, as a community and as a newspaper, uh, to end the uh, the period of mourning and get on with life, and uh, that's what that's what we determined to do early on. I think it's what the mayors have expressed, or Bob has expressed, that uh, the Grand Forks community is not just going to come back to what it was, just as the Herald did not come back to a small press room or a small mail room. We decided to build for the future and to think about the future, which is what we think is in everybody's best interest and. and is really the future of, of Grand Forks. Um, it's a bittersweet moment to win this prize because we know what happened. We know that it, it, it was a, a, a disaster that, that, uh, that caused it, and we would not wish it upon ourselves even, uh, even for the honor that, that we received. And, but it was a tremendous effort by our staff, by our readers, by our advertisers, by everybody in this room who supported us uh, and really buoyed us up as, uh, as, the, um, as the days were long and the work was hard. But bringing a newspaper out, helping keep the community together uh, was a really great effort for us and uh, to be recognized today for that is uh, really our pleasure. So uh, we look at this as an end, an end of a year when we got a recognition and we're proud of it, but the sun's gonna come up tomorrow, we gotta to put a paper out tomorrow, uh, we're gonna to tangle tomorrow, I'm sure, you know, that's, what, that's, that's sort of our, our nature. But uh, together, we all realize we're part of a larger community and together we are really going to rebuild this 
this region, the city, uh, to something bigger and better and stronger than it has ever been before. Uh, with our help and with all of your help, uh, we really uh, look forward to, to doing that. So enjoy yourself, take a look around, and um, I do appreciate everybody being here, and uh, thank you very much. Thinking about when, uh, uh, when you left on temporary duty, and... Uh, Lake City welcomes you with this little ditty. We're here to commend you for the great step you're taking, and to say we appreciate the difference you'll be making. The chamber is behind you to lend a helping hand as our community rebuilds and takes a new stand. And we, the members of the Chamber Top Hatters, would like you to know that your business to matters. Our hats are off to you.